Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're joined with, Ju- by, with Ju- excuse me, Judy Zucker is joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio Program today to talk about the newest book known as The Memory Diet. Through this book, you'll discover more than 150 healthy recipes for proper care and feeding of your brain. One of those things you can discover is that going to more of a plant-based diet, which eliminates a lot of the things that are either directly sugar or turn into sugar, are going to be one of these very things that will be very beneficial to helping you do that. You'll also discover how this particular new diet can fight Alzheimer's disease and dementia as well. That will be great for the people who are aging and wondering whether or not that might be something that might onset and kind of disrupt their lives. Well, this is a way that they can avoid something like that. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Judy Zucker. Judy, thank you for joining us here. Hey, it's my pleasure, Daniel. Glad to be here. Now, it must be exciting to know that at the age of 11 you turned into a vegetarian. What was going on there? <laughs> well, we actually had, see, my twin sister, Shari, and I, are the authors of The Memory Diet, as you just said. And when we were 11 years old, we were in a class with an art teacher who was very, should I say, hippie-ish? But he was really beyond uh, his years in knowledge, and he talked about a plant-based diet. And it resonated with us, so we became vegetarians at 11 years old. And it was easy for us in a way because our mother was such a horrible cook that we started making recipes at home and putting foods together, and our dad was real happy. And so we just started, that was our first kind of uh, experience with dealing with recipes and foods, and then we started perfecting it and researching health and nutrition. And years later, we became we got degrees in nutrition and physical education from UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara. Now, it's interesting to note that apparently every four seconds, someone is diagnosed with dementia, and over 47 million people worldwide suffer from dementia and Alzheimer's disease, but you pretty much state this just doesn't have to happen. This is not a normal part of aging, yet as you listen, you know, for instance, through media, it seems, this seems to be something that we're just coming to expect to happen to us. You know, how did we get to that point? Oh, Daniel, you are so absolutely right. I mean, there are over 5 million people in the United States alone that suffer from Alzheimer's. And a scary thing is it's the sixth leading cause of death in America, and it, it, it supersedes um, the uh, cancer of prostate and breast combined. So it's very scary, but it doesn't have to happen. There are preventive issues and measures that we can take to prevent memory loss. And I'd love to share them with you because we are real experts at this because our mother was diagnosed eight years ago with dementia, and it was really scary for us. And we were like, what did our mother do wrong or was this genetic? And the doctor said it was environmentally induced. So we started looking at her lifestyle and realized that many things that she did caused this memory loss, unfortunately. Now, it's really interesting, as I was stating, that we have come to the point where it seems this is becoming accepted as a normal thing in aging, but yet this isn't so true as this doctor says this is more environmental. How did we get to that point? Well, first of all, we have, unfortunately, people have a very processed food diet. Most, a lot of people do, and and, it, and it's from that generation. I mean, my mother had the microwave dinners and fast foods and processed foods and lots of sugar and red meat. Um, when we wrote The Memory Diet, we were determined to give hope to others and help people through our experience of our mother's dementia. And through our research, we found that scientifically based that we found information that really could help people. And one of the things that we found out was called the MIND diet, which is the Mediterranean Intervention Neurodegenerative um, Delay, which in, at Rush University in Chicago, they studied people for nine years over the age of 59 and looked at their lifestyles and gave them certain type of diets. And the ones that they did more plant-based diet they were able to reduce their chances of getting dementia by 53%. Now, I'm sure that as you're out and you're talking about your book, The Memory Diet, that you get people <clears throat> wondering about cooking food, and you've talked about this uh, once or twice here. 
What is it about the way that people prepare food cooking-wise that causes it to maybe not be so good for you? Wow, that is an excellent question. Here's the thing. A lot of people eat fried foods or they burn their foods or brown them, and that increases what they call advanced glycation end products, which is called AGEs. So you want to limit grilling, broiling, frying, microwaving foods, and try to keep the temperatures lower than 250 when you um, cook foods. This is what happens is that the sugar content and the glycation that happens in the product in the foods are so high that that affects our insulin level in our brain, and it's really unhealthy for us. So basically, try to stick to fruits and vegetables. And if you do have salmon or fish and you do broil it, that's a good idea. I mean, just to kind of steam it instead. If you put acidic products on it like lemon or apple cider vinegar, it reduces the AGEs in the foods. But the best thing to do is really stay away from red meat. Uh, Red meat is just not healthy for the brain. It's also very high in iron, which is also not great for the brain. And it's saturated fats. And the iron accumulates in the brain. So in in our studies, we found that it's better to stay away from red meat, butter, cheese, pastries, and fried foods. Another thing, too, that you talk quite a bit about is staying away from uh, gluten as well. Tell us why. Okay, well, um, in, there was a, a very uh, ex- excellent book called Brain Grain. And so uh, uh, basically the, uh, Dr. Perlmutter discussed this, but we've also discussed it in our book and talked about the importance of staying away from gluten because it causes brain fog in the brain. Sometimes people can't concentrate as well. And also gluten inter- interferes with digestion and gut health is very important for brain health. People need to realize that. That's why in the memory diet we talked about certain supplements that are excellent for the body and for the brain, like B12, folic acid, the B vitamins, omega-3 fatty acids. We talk about how you can get it through the foods. And probiotics, which is excellent for gut health. And resveratrol, which is found in grapes, which are excellent for the brain. Now, there are seven essential food groups that you outline in the memory diet. Why don't we go ahead and touch on each one of those and, and talk about what the importance of that is. Okay, that's, that's an excellent idea. Okay, in the memory diet, we talked about the seven brain-boosting food groups. And we'll start with the first one, which is cruciferous vegetables and cabbage. So I love cabbage and I love cauliflower. My husband loves Brussels sprouts. I'm not crazy about them, but see if you have anything in this group, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, bok choy, kale. This is fantastic for the brain. There, there are nutrients in these vegetables that protect against free radicals and keep the blood flowing, and they help remove heavy metals that can damage the brain. So if you can eat cabbage, it's excellent, like I said, broccoli, and that, those are really excellent for the brain. And number two is leafy greens. We're talking about spinach, collard greens, mustard, turnip, romaine and red leaf lettuce that are high in folic acid, which are the B vitamins and vitamin E, which helps improve cognitive health and, and it reduces cognitive decline. So it slows down, it slow down the, effort, I mean, the effects of aging on the brain. I personally love romaine lettuce and red leaf lettuce, and I have huge salads like every day. And... If you can, we recommend getting organic produce, and we can talk about that a little bit later too. But the third group are the seeds and nuts. Now, seeds and nuts like walnuts and almonds and cashews and pistachios and flax seeds especially um, and sesame seeds and chia seeds are excellent. Sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds are excellent for the brain. They're high in DHA and EPA, which are the omega-3 fatty acids that we hear about. Now, I just want to stop there for a second, Daniel, on omega-3 fatty acids. A lot of people are into eating salmon and into fish to get those omega-3s, which are great for the brain. The only problem with salmon and fish is often contaminated waters, which are high in mercury, which is not good for the brain. So we recommend either a supplement like DHA or eating flax seeds, sunflower seeds, and pumpkin seeds, and the walnuts. And and, And these are good fats for the brain. This problem that America has had is sticking to this low-fat diet, and there's 
different fats that are actually good for the brain and fats that are good for the body opposed to the saturated fats or trans fats that are not good for the brain. So the fourth group are the fruits, grapes, and berries, okay? They contain antioxidants, which are very helpful for the brain because we need oxygen for the brain. And there's a product that berries have especially because of the color, and it's called amphicenin, and it's called and the flavonoids that protect the brain against further damage from free radicals. So some people say, okay, can I have red wine and lots of wine because they're made from grapes and they probably have resveratrol and they're high in antioxidants? Well, I think it counteracts that when you have too much wine because alcohol is actually toxic for the brain. So I would stick with grape juice and eating grapes. I think you're better off. And number five, beans, legumes, and whole grains. So we're talking about our complex carbohydrates here, the really good B, vit B vitamins, carbohydrates for the brain, because when people ingest beans, it has a low steady supply of glucose, and glucose is the fuel to the brain, and it affects the insulin levels. Insulin is the hormone in the brain. So, and this is why diabetics are do well on the memory diet because this is oh, it reduces the chances of people getting too much sugar in their body. So, number six, olive coconut, macadamia nut, and avocado oil. Now, avocados are excellent for the brain, and we've heard that coconut is good for the brain. And the reason why coconut oil is so good for the brain is because it has what they call MCTs, which are medium-chain triglycerides, which break down into ketones, which is brain food. So you want to get extra virgin coconut oil, and, and I actually like to put coconut oil on my hair and on my body, too. So, I mean, coconut oil is terrific for the body. And the coconut oil and the olive oil and the macadamia oil are have what they call monosaturated fats, which protect the nerve cells in the brain. And the seventh great brain-boosting food group are brain spices. So we're looking at turmeric, which is an anti-inflammatory um, and supplement, and black pepper, an herb, and garlic and ginger and cinnamon and rosemary and sage and green tea. Now, turmeric contains curcumin, which inhibits a neurotoxin that has been linked to neurodegenerative disease. And also the interesting thing is in India, incidentally, they have the lowest incidence. They, don't, they barely have any Alzheimer's and because they eat a lot of foods with curry in it. And curry powder has turmeric. And this is, again, is an anti-inflammatory, and it's excellent for the brain. And ginger, ginger is part of the um, turmeric family. This is excellent for the brain, too. You know, it's really interesting when you think about how we're told one time, you know, this is really good for us, and the next time they come around and they say, well, maybe this isn't so good for you. And you kind of get really confused about what to do. So what are some simple steps you can suggest to our listeners to know that you're on the right track with what it is that you do in your diet. Okay. Well, it is a combination of diet and lifestyle. And I just want to go back for a second on that because you're right. Over the years, we hear, oh, canola oil is, well, years and years ago, it was the oil to use, and it's really not good for you at all. And, it, and, it, and, it, and also, it's one of the highest gmo type of oils, and we do not suggest anybody have genetically modified foods and stick with organic and especially local produce if they can go to their farmer's market. But back to that, what you said, what people can do. Well, the number one thing people can do to reduce cognitive decline or memory loss is to exercise. They can reduce their chances of getting dementia by 50% if they just exercise on a daily basis. Do you exercise, Daniel, on a daily Actually, basis? I do quite a bit of walking. That's Mm -hmm. Oh, that is so fabulous for you. I used to like to run, you know, but then I realized, you know, you're kind of jolting and, and hammering your body away, and, you know, you walk a little bit further, but it's just as enjoyable. Sometimes more enjoyable. <laughs> but I, I have to say that I personally run every morning, but I have good insoles, and I don't, like, really run hard, but I just love it because I've been running since I was in high school. My sister and I run, and we also swim. Swimming is excellent for the body. It, it helps um, with the muscles and relaxing them, and it's, it does, it's not hard on the body, so it's a great form of exercise. And, and walking. Walking is 
fabulous. Plus, if, plus if you walk with a friend, you can really uh, it, it goes by faster. And so, but we suggest sometimes it's fun to listen to music, but you can't really hear people around you and stuff for safety purposes. We suggest exercising without um, headphones and things so you can hear around you. Now, people will take a look at this book, and I'm sure some of them will question the idea. Well, you're suggesting to more move away or move toward a more of a vegetable or plant-based diet, and you know Stephen Jobs is somebody who was known to be vegetarian, and right. they would kind of scratch their heads. Well, then, what was the story with him getting cancer? And it was suggested by a particular doctor that says, well. You know, he had his own personal chef, and generally what he did was he cooked a lot of things in olive oil, and he says that was actually really the problem. That's what caused or potentially caused the problem. Then his doctors just finished him off by doing the chemo and the radiation and everything else. And I thought to myself, well, it sounded surprising at first, but I thought, well, you know, that makes sense because olive oil is certainly not something that you heat up. So if you're thinking of good oils or fats, what would you suggest to our listeners to pay attention to and how they should be used? Well, that's a good point. First of all, olive oil is actually good for the body, but if you heat it up and it starts to burn and steam, that becomes toxic. So that's not good for the body. So you want to, if you're going to heat up oils, and we and we have this whole section in the, the memory diet called How to Stock a Mindful Kitchen, and we talk about the certain oils and at what temperatures they can actually be heated at, and coconut oil would be a good one and to use to bake with and to cook with. And if you cook with oils, you want to do it at a low heat, again, because we discussed that earlier about advanced glycation end products, which are the AGEs. And you really want to stay away from things that are high, foods that are high in AGEs like meat and animal products. So, yes, it's, it's best to use oils in moderation, and to use oils such as coconut oil or macadamia nut oil as far as cooking is concerned. Olive oil is good for salad dressings. Now, what about, for instance, using ghee as an oil to cook with? Because, you know, I understand, you know, as we're talking about here, you know, olive oil doesn't really have a high temperature point, so it's susceptible to burning. Right. Whereas ghee is one of those that you can get up to extremely high temperatures and you won't have a whole lot of problem with it. If somebody chooses that, yes, that could work. But um, I, I would, that's and more of a butter product. But I would say that sticking with the coconut oil is probably a better choice there. Now, when you were putting this together, both you and your sister, known as the, the twins. The double energy <laughs> twins, yes. That's bang right. and bang. Were there any surprises that, that jumped out at you and its simplicity when you said, geez, you know, I would have never thought of something like that? Oh, you know, Daniel, that is such a good question. When we did this research, we were determined to help others because I'm telling you, dementia is a thief and it's robbed our mother. And we can. And, and when we did our research, we found out, we didn't realize one of the things that she always did was antihistamines. She would take Benadryl antihistamines all the time. She was always blowing her nose. She was having allergies and stuff. And... Antihistamines, and even words with anti in front of them, often they're known as anticholinergic drugs. And people can use them and overuse them, even over the counters and standard drugs, and they can play um, a big part in dementia. And so it's, it, it, they get, so it's kind of like avoid anesthesia also and, and toxic chemicals like statin drugs sleeping pills, too. People don't realize that Ambien is so bad for the brain. And diet pills, you know, prescription drugs cause more, I mean, more than 100,000 deaths per year and cause 1.9 million people have side effects from, from drugs, prescription drugs. And so it's important to realize this. So stay away, if you can, from anticholinergic drugs. Like I said, the antihistamines. And someone will say, what if I'm congested and stuff? I suggest a very easy way to help with congestion. It's called a neti. Have you ever, you know the neti pot? It's like this little, it looks like a little tiny uh, teapot. And you warm up water with a little bit of a, a salt or iodine solution. And you put it through your nostrils and, and drain them. And it helps better than any drug, really. 
you know, it's really amazing when you consider that diet is so essential to, you know, people weaning off, for instance, medications. Uh, we've had a couple of times on the program a gentleman out of uh, the southwestern part of the United States who actually reverses diabetes fairly consistently. Oh, yeah. And it was really fascinating because we were doing a trade show. We like to show up and, you know, of course, promote the radio show. And then <clears throat> I heard uh, my wife and those what seemed to be not a heated conversation, but certainly a passionate one with a gentleman behind me as I was talking with someone else. And what was funny was, and this was, uh, I think, part of a diabetes expo, and uh, so then I turned and she says to me, this gentleman here doesn't believe you can reverse diabetes, <laughs> okay? And what was funny is you could see the body language that he was bracing himself for me to go, well, you know, maybe argue the point. And I just kind of smiled, and I said, well, that's his choice. I said, if he doesn't believe it, then there's no chance of it happening for him. Right. The, the, mind, <laughs> the mind is so strong, but, you have, but really, food can heal or harm you. And it's so important to realize that. Ironically, there are two, like I said earlier, the, the greatest thing one can do to avoid memory loss is to exercise every day. They can reduce their chances of getting Alzheimer's by 50%. But the worst, the worst thing someone can do for their body and for their brain is smoking. I mean, it's toxic to the body, and it increases the odds of getting dementia by over 80%. And that's scary. So that those are two lifestyle choices that people have to think about right away. One, to exercise, which is good, and one, to avoid smoking. Also, they're finding that not just food, but certain things that people do are causing the dementia. And there's even a, a word that are known as dementia called alcohol-induced dementia. And people can get dementia by drinking alcohol way too much. Alcoholics have a higher chance of getting dementia. So that's pretty scary, too, let alone it's toxic for the brain. Now, when people try to approach this, I'm sure they find it difficult, you know, when you've developed a lifestyle, especially over a long period of time, that, you know, making changes for a lot of people, well, let's face it, as Americans, we like to look for the best, and then we like to go all the way with it. <laughs> you know, we can't just seem to subtly or slowly introduce changes into our diet. But, you know, that's one of the ways that you actually become successful is subtle changes. For instance, in your book, you talk about, you know, what would be a good substitute for milk? And here's, here's a fact, okay? I use either coconut milk or almond milk. Me too. Okay. And, you and know, unsweetened. Yeah, exactly. And what was interesting is years ago I went to what was called a body talk expert, which was a pretty interesting experience. And she says, your body's having trouble with milk, okay? And it was interesting because there was a long period of time I just didn't bring milk into the house, you know, and usually I tried to get as whole milk as you can get if you're not next door to a dairy. Right. And the next thing I know is I started having these stomach aches and I found myself drinking the milk to alleviate it. You know, but the fact was is it was the milk that was actually causing this in the first place. So I thought, well, if she's telling me that milk is a problem, then why don't I go ahead and eliminate it again and see what happens? And sure enough, within a week, I didn't have that problem anymore. See, Daniel, the body wants to heal. It always does. Oh, yes. And so the thing is, it's never too late to rejuvenate. When they did the mind study at Rush University in Chicago, and they studied people for nine years that were over 59, so like, the, the 60 to 90 age group. And these people, a lot of them were toxic. They had terrible diets. But by putting them on a plant-based diet and making small lifestyle choice, you know, differences, this really, like I said, reduced their chances of getting dementia by 53%. This was fantastic. And they were all really basically over 60 years old, which is, could be young if you think young. It's, it's not that bad. But the scary thing is, so many people are making um, uh, not very bright choices with their body, unfortunately. And um, whether it be smoking, whether it be drinking too much alcohol, whether it be eating too much sugar, and um, also taking over-the-counter drugs. Because we live in a quick-fix society where people want to be cured immediately. And sometimes this takes a while. And, but the body will work with you, will work with us to try to stay healthy, and we need to help that body, especially when we sleep at night. That's when we start to rejuvenate. But the next day when somebody goes and does toxic things again, like if somebody 
smokes all day and then they go to bed, they're probably healthier during the night when they're sleeping. But then they wake up again and then they start smoking again, the body will just eventually start to break down. But if somebody decides, okay, listen, I like certain foods and maybe I can switch them gradually. Like if somebody's used to eating a lot of meat, well, they could try some things like portobello mushrooms and, and, and walnuts and some of the great recipes that we have in our book that, that are, are, are still tasty and it, it satisf- satisfies the taste buds of anybody that had eaten meat in the past. I mean, I just made the, um, the walnut tacos and the book and the memory diet, and it's, it's delicious, and it's very meaty tasting if somebody has a, who wants kind of that meaty flavor. And, but then again, some people might just like uh, something that's very simple, like the, the great guacamole in the book or the black rice and mango salad with walnuts. I mean, there's so many wonderful recipes in the book that are easy to make and that are sugar-free, plant-based, and gluten-free, which is great for the brain. You know, and what was interesting, what I was actually alluding to earlier about the milk substitution was the fact that I started cooking with the coconut milk, you know, like baking recipes that maybe required milk. And, you know, or if, and I don't eat dry cereal, but once in a great while you run out and you buy a box, what the heck. And, uh, and I realized, you know, this wasn't really that much of an adjustment. And I mean, I was somebody who grew up across the street from a dairy farm, so I knew what it was like to get milk right from the cow. Which was and you go to the store, and it's nothing like that. <laughs> you know? Oh, I know, I know. And because of that, you know, you know, your almond or your coconut milk may taste a little more watery if you're used to getting, you know, more whole milk. But the fact was, is it really didn't take much of an adjustment for me to go that route. And I haven't had any dairy milk in the house, you know, really since. Not that, you know, I had it really before. But the fact is, is I really didn't have it since. And another thing too was bread. You know, outside of a sandwich, I never really had bread in the house. You know, and now that everybody is beginning to feel like they have these gluten intolerances because of the hybrid wheat that we use to produce the bread, you know, they're moving toward different ways. And you had mentioned tacos, and I remember when I was uh, growing up that when my mom would make tacos, she would always fry the tortillas, of course, in a vegetable oil or something, you know, to kind of make them hard. And and one day I just simply said, I don't want to do this anymore, even though it was a way that I learned, and I just simply would bake them in the oven until they were soft enough, and I was like, this is much more enjoyable this way. So, you know, it's interesting how you can take the the habits that you have, if you can learn how to do something different in a way that really benefits you, and just tweak it a little bit, you'll be surprised at how easy it really is to change, and the more you move toward fresh food, you know, fresh uh, food, you'll find yourself not really wanting that other stuff that you used to crave because I think it flicks a signal. You know, it's like when you go to a fast food place, you supersize a meal, and an hour later you're hungry again, which makes no sense. (laughs) Well, you know what? You're absolutely right. Our taste buds, like, get retrained in a way when we start eating healthy. We don't crave that junk food anymore. And that's real important. And also, there's substitutes. Like, I love the quinoa walnut burgers in our, in our book, and there are substitutes if, if somebody wanted a, a kind of a meaty taste. And then the mac and cheese in the book, well, we use, and even in the veggie lo mein, um, lo mein, mein, the veggie lo mein, we put gluten-free noodles. And so it's very easy. You just have to read the instructions because gluten, cooking gluten-free pasta is different than regular pasta. Sometimes it can get the water can get murky, and you just have to really stick to the time timing it and everything. But it turns out great. I mean, uh, and also it, sweets are concerned. Like when we made recipes in our book, we made sure that we didn't have any refined sugars in it, and we used either pure maple syrup or raw honey. But some people are super vegan and they don't like to use honey, so we suggest different fruit sweeteners in the book and it, it, it's just so much better it's so it's so healthy and it tastes so good now you mentioned earlier about probiotics and this is something you're beginning to see really emerge on the diet horizon now but it st- seems still a little slow uh, but we've actually produced a couple of segments uh, when it comes to building gut health and the bu- uh, gut brain connection yeah, there's yeah. actually been a connection made between those to what would be known as a link to possible children uh, being on the autistic spectrum. You know, oh, yeah, they're not really autistic, 
but that they have symptoms of autism because of poor gut health. And it's really interesting some of the things that you can do. For instance, I learned to make kombucha tea. About a year ago I started doing it, and I'm making an average of five gallons a month. <laughs> wow, you make your own. That's impressive. That's it's really easy, high but it's easy it. and it's interesting. You know, that's the thing about it uh, is that it's interesting. You know, I live in Portland, Oregon, and, you know, they're nuts here anyway. Beer capital of the world, it's going to be a wine capital now, but now kombucha is also sprouting up all over the place too. So apparently these little kitchen sink farmers are realizing, boy, this stuff is not only easy to make but fast, but now I'm making so much of it, I might as well sell it. But Oh, a lot of people are into that. Yeah, and here's people. what's fascinating about that that I learned. You know, there was kombucha and kefir. And uh, what was interesting about the probiotic levels in these are so incredible that you couldn't buy a top-grade pharmaceutical-grade probiotic that will give you the cultures to the level that these things would do. And these are so natural, and they're very inexpensive to do, you know. And it's, it's really interesting terrific? how much it changed everything. I mean, I could feel the change. I didn't know what to expect from kombucha, but, I, you know, it tastes pretty good. You can infuse it. You can have some fun. And I know one of the things you, ta- you talk about in your book, uh, the, my- the Memory Diet, is learning new skills, you know, things like that. And when you're getting involved in your diet in this particular way, you're not trying to be, you know, on a crusade, but make it interesting, you know, make it something that, right. geez, I want to learn this, and this is what your book really adamantly tries to say is, Let's play, let's have fun, and let's learn, because that's one of the other big reasons you can reduce things like Alzheimer's and dementia. Right. Eating healthy is fun, and you feel better. And there's so many tasty foods out there, and that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to make it easy for people to eat healthy and have, you know, and, and, and create, a, you know, possibilities for them and expand their food horizons. And I think that's great about your kombucha, and I think that's great that you make it yourself and stuff. That's industrious. I mean, we, if people can try, I mean, really try to make their own foods at home, that's just better than any processed foods, and it tastes better, and it's very rewarding, too. And uh, in our book, like when I make the banana walnut muffins, and we have a, a section in the recipes called uh, Change It Up, so if somebody doesn't want walnuts, they can use pecans in it or whatever. But basically, I store them up to six months if I have extra banana muffins. But usually, everybody eats them too fast. But basically, if I do have extra, then I store them. And that's a great thing. You can just pop them in the oven when you have a snack attack or you feel like you want you crave something. You know, it's interesting you talk about that as being a snack and a craving because one of the things that I started doing uh, a couple of months back is at the supermarket that I'll shop at, there's a section over by their deli where they lay out. You can get green olives, stuffed olives, okra, you know, and and a lot of these are fermented foods. In fact, they all are. And one of the snacks that I was getting there, it was a Kalmata and green olive mixture with feta cheese cubes. Oh, wow, okay. And I'd sit there, and I'd get, you know, a 20-ounce container of this and usually eat it in a night, and I was talking to somebody about that, and they said, you know, you're getting an incredible amount of protein when you do that, and plus you've also got the olive oil naturally. And, and I'm saying, you know, but I just love the taste of the snack. It wasn't really about whether it's healthy. It just happens to be very healthy because it's also a fermented food. Uh, talk about <clears throat> the importance that you know of, of why fermented foods can be very important in a diet. Well, because it, it, whether it be prebiotics or probiotics, they're excellent for gut health. You know, that's that's where that that's the importance of that. That it's so good for the the gut, and if it's good for the gut, like you, we talked about, it's good for the brain. It's kind of like when we were kids when they said the knee bone is connected to the leg bone. That song, and the leg bone is connected to the foot bone. Well, ba- I'm not a good singer, so I'm not going to sing it for you because I don't want to like break any glass here. But basically, all these are interconnected. The, the heart and the brain are interconnected, and so this is real important. It's great. It puts all that good bacteria into the intestines, which aids to digestion. And if you have good digestion, you have better brain health. And the other thing, too, is I was uh, talking with a guest some time ago, and uh, he considers himself, as you heard me mention earlier, a kitchen sink farmer. <laughs> okay. Kitchen- and he believes that you can actually sustainably grow in a, even a one-bedroom apartment all the food you will ever need to nourish yourself. 
Well, that's good for him, and I, I applaud him for that. I'm not, I'm not that industrious. Yeah, but some of us I, don't I do feel have an organic garden. <laughs> but, you know, he was, he was really interesting because one of the things he likes to talk about is sprouting. You know, where you actually take, for instance, the chia seed you mentioned earlier, sunflower yeah. seeds or pumpkin seeds. I do the alfalfa, but I do sprout. I do sprout. Uh-huh. That's really great. And he sprouts these, and he says what's really interesting is as you sprout them, you only sprout them, you know, enough to where the, the I guess the plant part of it comes out, and it's easy the length of the seed and that's as far as you go and that's all you need to do for that kind of sprouting and then you can eat them put them on a salad or put them in smoothies but he says what really becomes fascinating is you will find that in a fairly short period of time that your food is going to begin to energize you which is quite opposite of what we're used to especially in America where we have those food crashes after you eat, you feel like taking a nap you know so you, you oh, gotta yeah. know something's not right there you know if you're Needing, right. you're becoming tired after eating. Then, then there's something that you're that that you're doing that your body is trying to shut down because it has to now expend energy to to break this stuff down. So that's why you feel tired. He was saying. Yeah, and but so, also sleep is very important. We talk about it in the book for brain health. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can feel tired. At times, you can eat a really healthy meal and feel tired afterwards. I'm wondering how much sleep you had before you ate, too. But mm-hmm. food should be rejuvenating, definitely. Mm-hmm. And now I want to know, uh, it was really interesting as I was looking over these recipes a couple of nights ago, there was one I had never heard of before, berry soup. (laughs) Berry soup, yeah. You know what, sometimes it's like a a soup smoothie. It's really delicious. Um, Like I said, gazpacho, a lot of people like cold soups in the summertime. So we wanted to be creative there because, see, berries, especially since most people know blueberries, also known as brain berries, so high in antioxidants, but I'll tell you, chia seeds is almost equivalent to the amount of antioxidants, too, that are excellent for the brain, as blueberries are. And it's so important to incorporate these delicious fruits and vegetables in our diet and to make it fun. So that's why we put these recipes together. So, yeah, berry soup is one of them, and there's the gazpacho soup in there with avocado in it, because avocados are so good for the brain. And, you know, we do a lot of... We, we're like scientists in the kitchen. We love to eat, but we love to eat healthy, too. And when we created these recipes in the memory diet, we made sure they were tasty because nobody wants to sacrifice flavor for anything. No, and in fact, as you find yourself uh, moving more toward natural flavors, you'll come to realize just how dead the synthetic ones feel. <laughs> oh, gosh. And it's so scary because we always say read the label before it goes on the table. And it's... we. There are so many artificial preservatives and additives and toxins, unfortunately, in processed foods and foods. It's really important to read those labels, like the BHT, BHA. I mean, even propylene glycol, which is used in cars, has been, I've seen it in foods as fillers, even in vitamins. And we, we need to look at our cosmetics, too, even the creams we put on our bodies, the sodium lauryl sulfate that's in cleaning so cleaning products that we put on our bodies. We need to be sulfate-free. We need to think about perfumes and phthalates and all the bad things that are unfortunately toxic, but it makes for products to be cheaper. And so the companies like to make them, but we sh- as consumers should not buy them because they really can be toxic to our bodies. And that will affect brain health too. Chemicals. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I know if I don't have to read too many labels because when I shop, I usually shop around the outside. <laughs> that's oh, where well, all that's the food smart. actually is. <laughs> that's I can really, pick up really a carrot smart. and I don't have to read a label. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and hopefully you get organic. Because, I mean, if you can get organic, that's important. And also buying seasonally, that's also important. Because when you buy seasonally, it's going to taste better, too. And if one can go to their farmer's market, that's terrific. So these are all helpful suggestions to having a more, let's say, clean diet, healthier life. And like I said, it's never too late to rejuvenate. I I have seen people in their 60s get rid of diseases because they started making lifestyle choices, healthy ones. Not only that, we uh, had a guest on the program. It's pretty fascinating that you say that because he actually, his mother was the age of 74. He changed a lot of things. She was actually at stage four emphysema. 
Oh, wow. was dragging around an oxygen bottle, all of it. I mean, it was the beginning of the end for her, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. As an engineer, he decided to approach, okay, what is emphysema, da-da-da-da-da. You know, she was a smoker for a lot of years, and he thought, well, this is unusual. If he quit smoking, this, you know, shouldn't be here anymore. So he looked into it a lot more. And so he started making dietary changes, you know, taking care of preparing her meals, eliminating a lot of things like sugar, for instance, uh, was one of the big ones, or anything that converts to sugar, you know, trying to eliminate that out of her diet as much as he could. And within 17 months, he actually reversed the symptoms of emphysema in a 74-year-old lady. And the doctors somehow were astounded by all this, and he says, with all your training, why is all this a mystery to you? Well, you know, I'm reading a book right now that's called um, How Not to Die. And it talks, and, it, and, 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 the, and, the, and the person who wrote it is a doctor. And they have very little training in nutrition at med school. And this, again and again, people who take control of their lives and, and eat healthy and make smart food lifestyle choices, food and lifestyle choices, can sometimes, often, reverse diseases and become healthier and feel better. And they don't, and they get off drugs like statin drugs and drug. Some, and a lot of people get type two diabetes, which is the latter diabetes in life. They, when they started exercising and eating healthy and re- reducing their weight, they got rid of their their diabetes went away. They didn't need to take all those drugs. Pretty amazing what the body will tolerate and how it'll hold on, even when you're not making good choices for it. And then when you finally do, then you realize, geez, this seems like a miracle that I've reversed all this when your body's been screaming at you the whole time. <laughs> right. Well, you know, but i got to tell you something, Daniel. It's people like you and your wonderful wife, Joy, that make a difference in people's lives. The people that are listening to this, you guys are on a crusade to inspire people to live healthful lifestyles. And this is what we need in society, people who kind of give people some food for thought. And this is fantastic what you are doing. I applaud it. Well, I like being applauded by celebrities. It makes me a happy person. (laughs) And the more you can get applause from celebrities, the better life you're going to have. Well, you get a double applaud from the double energy twin. Okay? (laughs) i got to tell you, we're really proud of you guys. Because this is, it's getting the word out. It's, it, it's letting people know that like a, it, it, you can change things. You could reverse things, possibly. You can live a healthier life. You, you have control over your body. Everybody does. And it is, it's, it's taking those small, tiny steps and then being committed to it. And like we discussed earlier, once people start eating healthier, they not only feel better, but they don't have those cravings for that junk food. They really don't. Now, I've got to say, there are exceptions to the rules. Uh, birthdays, holidays, but even on those days, the next day you kind of have like a food hangover. You, you just go like, okay, I need to eat healthy again. But those are exceptions to the rule days. And, and also when you go out to a dinner or lunch or breakfast and sometimes there might be sugar in a salad dressing, you just can't throw a fit about it. But what you do consistently on a daily basis to make a difference in your health, that's what you can do on a daily basis consistently. And that's eating not just fruits and vegetables, but organic fruits and vegetables, free of genetically modified organisms or GMOs, and also try to make smart food choices, eat when you're hungry, avoid sugar, eat, avoid processed foods, avoid preservatives, additives. And when you eat, if, if one has to eat fish or chicken or meat, to get grass-fed meats and, and get uh, most natural sources they can because farm fish is not great for the body at all, and so people want their omega-3s. And we've got problems with our polluted lakes and oceans, so they're high in mercury. So really, a plant-based diet just con- makes sense, but also it tastes great too. There, like we did, we, we, we created recipes that people wouldn't miss meat at all, and they would feel so much better, and they would be able to have greater brain health. Well, I certainly agree with you that. The book is The Memory Diet. Our guest joining us on the program, Judy Zucker. Now, is there a website, and how can people find the book? 
Well, great question. Yes, they can go to our website, doubleenergytwins.com. That's Double Energy Twins. They can even sign up for a recipe of the month. They can see our book, The Memory Diet, More Than 150 Healthy Recipes for the Proper Care and Feeding of Your Brain. They can see that. They can click the Amazon or the Barnes & Noble if they wish to get the book. And there's also our other books, The Ultimate Allergy-Free Cookbook and The Ultimate Allergy-Free Snack Cookbook. So all these books are plant-based. They are all... Um, sugar-free and gluten-free and dairy-free. So they're delicious and fun. I mean, these books, and they give great information that is scientifically based and it's helpful information. They'll have aha moments. Well, wow, I didn't know that. This is what I could do, the simple steps that I can do to be healthier. Absolutely. Start taking control of how your body feels by making sure you're proactive to move in the direction to have the kind of health you're looking for. Judy, I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. If you, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our listeners? Well, I think that the most important thing is that to know that it's never too late to rejuvenate, that people can start right today and they can get healthier and feel better and eat on a, a clean diet and they can improve their overall body health and brain health. Very good. Judy, thank you for joining us around the program. What a treat. Thank you so much. You bet. We want to thank you, the listeners out there. You can find out more by discovering us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Sign up for our weekly e-newsletter so you can stay up to date on what's happening on the program and what's coming up. You can also follow us on Twitter at Beyond 50 Radio as well as Facebook. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.